Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the April 11, 2023 meeting of the Board of Supervisors. As you can see, I am attending remotely. I'm in Sacramento today for meetings right after this Board of Supervisors meeting uh, with our state legislative delegation in regards to the Pajaro River. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could uh, begin us with a roll call, please. Certainly, Chair. Supervisor Koenig? Here. Cummings? Here. Hernandez? Here. McPherson? Here. And Chair Friend? Here. If we could uh, begin with a moment of silence, does any board member like to dedicate today's moment of silence? Okay, we could have, um, we'll just begin with a moment of silence, please. Thank you, Vice Chair Cummings. Do you mind leading us in the pledge? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Palacios. Are there any changes to today's agenda? Uh, Chair Friend, there are no changes to today's agenda. Thank you. Are there any board members that would like to remove an item from consent to place on the regular agenda today? Okay, seeing none, we'll now open it up to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda, but are within the purview of the Board of Supervisors, or to also comment on an item on consent, or if you're unable to stay on an item on the regular agenda. We'd like to open it up. Good morning and welcome. Yeah, good morning, board, um, and Mr. Friend. I, it's great that you're in Sacramento. Um, well, as far as things that are not on the agenda, there's two items on the consent agenda. Number 19, the Cruzio uh, Information Services for 10 years, and number 32, the Public Safety and Justice, which are basically agenda 21, 2030 genocide geofencing kill grids through the SEEDS project, which came into this county in 1993 and was adapt, adopted in 1997. So I'm holding in my hand the Santa Cruz County agenda, where you can have three minutes to comment on um, the consent agenda items, and you have three minutes to comment on the regular agenda items, and you still have two minutes for public comments. So it's really interesting. I was in a conversation with a young lady yesterday who was questioning her teacher about the three different U.S. Constitution, three different U.S. constitutions, whereas this AP teacher said that there weren't three U.S. three U.S. constitutions. Um, I don't stand for the Pledge of Allegiance to the uh, United States under maritime law pirate flag. I don't know why anyone does. Our original constitution was really quite spectacular. Anybody can do some research and the information's right in the basement. And you look at, you can look and read about the Declaration of Independence. This nation was founded because of the oppression that was going on from the East India Trading Company in Britain. We have issues right now that are a thousand times more detrimental to everyone. Um, you know, maybe it's more people will speak later. Thank you. Thank you. Others for oral communications, public comment. Please feel free to step forward. Chair, Chair, it appears we have no further speakers in chambers. However, we do have speakers online. Please. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Caller 8204, your microphone is now available. Hello, my name is Diane, and I'm calling today um, also regarding number 19 on the cruise I.O. And um, I'm just going to read you something about smart cities and uh, big surveillance cities. So, um, which I think is where Santa Cruz City is heading. Um, it begins, when everyone and everything is connected, the door is open to all kinds of digital threats. Cities around the world are getting smarter. However, one defines them. Data-enabled cities are booming. By one estimate, there are over a thousand smart city projects underway around the world. 
Notwithstanding global enthusiasm for hyper-connected cities, the futuristic wired urban world has a dark side. What's more, the pitfalls may soon outweigh the supposed benefits. <coughs> That's because SMART is increasingly a euphemism for surveillance. Cities in at least 56 countries worldwide have developed, deployed surveillance technologies powered by automatic data mining, facial recognition, and other forms of artificial intelligence. Urban surveillance is a multi-billion dollar industry with Chinese and US-based companies such as Huawei, ZTE, and Axis leading the charge. Whether they are in China or elsewhere, smart cities are usually described as benign, in benign terms with a soothing promise of greener energy solutions, lower friction mobility, and safer streets. Yet in a growing number of places from San Francisco to Hong Kong, there are growing concerns about the ways in which supercharged surveillance is encroaching on free speech, privacy, and data protection. But the truth is that facial recognition and related technologies are far from the most worrisome features of smart cities. Part of what supposedly makes cities smarter is the deployment and integration of surveillance technologies, such as sensors and biometric data collection systems, electronic infrared thermal and LIDAR sensors. Thank you. Call in user one, your microphone's now available. Marilyn Garrett, thank you for that previous statement. I think it relates to uh, this statement. Number 19, people need food, employment, housing, and a healthy environment, not harmful broadband microwave radiation. Stop the deception. Stop the tsunami of Cruzio 5G broadband microwave radiation, that is military assault frequency. Put on a future regular agenda and or vote known now <clears throat> on number 19, a so-called 10-year trade agreement with Cruzio is to install 5G broadband on all county sites for, quote, enhanced public wireless internet access and other sources. Are the other sources what Diane just read about the smart surveillance uh, cities? Um, let's see, this, um, um, thousands of peer-reviewed studies by scientists independent of the industry conclusively prove serious long-term health effects from current exposures to wireless technologies, especially for children. These include, and you have been presented with data over a 20-year period, all of you on this, these consequences include cancer, neurological disorders, heart disease, sterility, including permanent DNA damage, diabetes, tinnitus, headaches. Additionally, you falsely state there is no financial impact. Samuel, your microphone is now available. Thank you. My name is Samuel Singer. I'm a property co-owner with my wife, Rebecca Steinberg, in the Big Basin Woods subdivision in Boulder Creek. Uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I want you to know that my wife, our seven-month-old baby, and I are not victims of the CZU fire. We purchased a lot in the Big Basin Woods last July and received a building permit uh, this January to put a 1,600-square-foot home on the property. Uh, because of a clerical error, we did not get on the county's or the Central Coast Water Board's email list to get updates regarding the Big Basin Water and Sanitation Companies. So you can imagine our surprise when we found out last week that the county, at the request of the board, would not be issuing certificates of occupancy until fuller notice. Uh, we were planning to move in uh, next month. We've now seen the images of the raw sewage um, flowing from the wastewater treatment plant basins, so we understand why the Water Board and County would suspend certificates. However, the problem we're now facing, as well as other fire victims are facing, uh, is that we are paying rent elsewhere uh, and our mortgages. 
until our properties get developed and our homes get built. We can't do that much longer. Um, we have a few more months until our financial situation with regards to this property becomes bleak. Uh, we work for nonprofits. Uh, we um, have a combined income of less than 200K, but we have 20,000 saved up for a buffer. Um, we're prepared to use those funds to support an alternative plan as articulated by the water board to have the potential of returning certificates of occupancy to Big Basin. What we're suggesting is to use those funds to equip the residents of Big Basin with composting toilets and gray water catchment systems to divert up to 40% of all wastewater and 100% of black water away from the treatment plant. We hope that Santa Cruz County and the water board will take those voluntary considerations uh, into consideration and allow us to return to our homes or move in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Singer. <clears throat> Call in user 1192, your microphone is now available. Call in user 1192, your microphone should now be available. Please accept the unmute. It appears call and user 1192 is unable to participate. I'm going to move on to the next caller. If you continue to wish to speak, please leave your hand up. Robin, your microphone is now available. Hi, thank you. Um, so I am also a part of this neighborhood that was just mentioned from the previous caller. Uh, I've never done anything like this before, and I haven't prepared any sort of speech or anything, but... I just don't know where else to turn. So our we have a family of four. We've been building our house. We are victims of the CZU fire. And we've been building our house in that neighborhood for the past two and a half years, um, following all the code. You know, we have a really good working relationship with our um, inspector. Um, we've worked so hard to get to this point, And we are literally days away from moving in. So you can just imagine how we felt when we got this letter um, that we were not going to be allowed to move in. And we are in the same situation where our, our insurance is paying for our rent, but um, but not until the end. I mean, it, it, that's over at the end of next month. So we literally will be homeless <laughs> if we are not moved back home. Um, this is a really, really, I haven't slept in four nights. I have two children in the SLV school system. I'm a school counselor. My husband is a, a huge contributor to our community and we are not going to have anywhere to live. So my question is, A, who wrote that letter? Because the letter doesn't acknowledge the hardship that we would be put through. Um, there's no mention. It's just kind of mean. It really hurt, to be honest. And uh, there was no mention of how, how difficult this would be that we would end up being homeless. And there's also no list of resources to help us. Um, so I'm just really, I'm hurt and I'm confused and I trusted our government and I trusted all of you to guide us to get to this point where, where we've gone through, God, we've just gone through um, so much and I've done so much to help try and help my kids through this trauma and they're doing okay, but this would literally ruin our lives. If we're not allowed to move back to our house in five weeks, this will ruin our lives. And I just don't know if it's worth, um, if it's worth it, if, it, if it's really worth it to you guys to, to kick a family out on the street. I don't think there's anyone else in our current situation that are, is this close to moving in, but I know there are at least three or four other families that have broken ground. And I know that the one next to us is is really probably just a couple of months away from um, from moving in, or maybe they're going to move in this summer. But anyway, that's all I have to say. I I feel like we're being punished for something that is not our fault. It's not my fault that the the water company didn't upkeep their sewer. It's not my fault that they weren't you know licensed and didn't use their insurance money to re repair the system so my fault that the fire happens right and but but yet we're having to pay even to have to pay for toilets you know that are special or whatever like that just doesn't seem fair so i just wanted you guys to hear directly from a mom and a, and a local counselor 
um, the amount of suffering that we are experiencing right now because we are literally days away from moving in and are now not going to be able to. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bates. Um, Ma'am, um, just a second. If if she would contact my office, this is Supervisor Bruce McPherson, uh, 454-2200, and give me some of the details. Uh, give my office some of the details. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Call in user 9483, your microphone is now available. Hi, good morning. I'm Mary Lou Sanfueli. Wanted to revisit again, hopefully having the county <clears throat> push through changes on tree removal, especially those darn blue gum eucalyptus, um, the area in La Selva, especially the uh, Marmonte, those trees keep falling, the property owners, I know it's an astronomical cost to remove them, but maybe there could be some way for the county to help them out to get those trees down with, uh, without requiring all this um, prolonged uh, review and are the trees, um, Dam, uh, gonna damage the properties. They've already fallen on houses. They're gonna fall again. There's some that are leaning, branches are leaning. And when those falls, it's gonna cause more injury besides the hundreds of thousands, if not up to a total of millions by now for the past 20 years of those trees falling, taking out the power lines and all the other cable and phone lines and the loss of uh, computers and uh, refrigerator loss, all the other things that happen to all the homes that are affected by this, along with all the other homes in the county. Blue gum is an, um, not a native, classified as a weed by the state of California, and they need to be take, taken out as soon as possible. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Call in user two, your microphone's now available. Call in user two, your microphone is now available. Please accept the unmute. As a reminder, it is star six to mute or unmute yourself. Unmute you yourself. are unmuted. Hi, my name is Diane Nickel. I'm calling about the um, because it's agenda item 19, where you're gonna be voting to, uh, whether or not to put more um, antennas, 5G antennas around the county, including on people's homes and apartment buildings. I want to call to your attention um, a court of appeal in the DC circuit <clears throat> ruling on August 13th, 2021, where the court, court of appeal, and then this was a, uh, the court ruled that the Federal Communications Commission failed to consider the, not, the evidence regarding adverse health effects of wireless technology uh, when it decided its 1996 radio frequency emission guidelines to uh, allegedly protect the public's health. So that was in August 13, 2021. The FCC is in the middle of rewriting regulations under pressure from this ruling. The FCC attempted to appeal it to the U.S. Supreme Court. The U.S. Supreme Court uh, ruled against the FCC and declined to accept the case, really. So this ruling stands and the Board of Supervisors should be alerted to the health impacts they're gonna be causing to families and children by allowing these um, antennas to be put up uh, right on people's apartment buildings and homes. It's, it's a real travesty. And you guys need to stop, you know, take a pause, see what the new regulations are gonna be. Or you, you know, you cause, harm to people and very likely harm actually. There are like 11,000 studies reviewed for this court of appeals ruling, 11,000. This is um, a massive number of, of studies showing harmful effects of radio frequency radiation from these antennas. So agenda, nine, agenda item 19 is on the, is what I'm talking about today. And please, please read up on this. Thank you. Okay. Call in user 1192. Your microphone should now be available. It's star six to mute or unmute yourself. Hi. Thank you for uh, taking my call. Um, 
Um, I want to read a little bit about critical facts everyone should know about the vaccine. Physicians and scientists worldwide are warning humanity that millions of people have died from the COVID vaccines in the past several years. Many attempts were made to develop a safe coronavirus vaccine, but they've all failed and the animals in the tests always died. While testing the clot shots, all animals died again. So they stopped testing. An untested medical experiment is now imposed on humanity for an illness with a survival rate of 99.7% and for which several 100% effective cures exist already. See the evidence on stopworldcontrol.com. Side effects usually manifest years after a vaccination, but with this COVID vaccine, millions of people have died already and been permanently disabled. Data from the CDC shows that in the US alone, thousands die every month. A whistleblower from the CDC signed a sworn affidavit that the true number of adverse events is at least five times higher than what is being reported. This means that tens of thousands die monthly from vaccines in the US alone. Worldwide, that number is many times higher, and in the coming years, this will explode as it takes years for most of adverse effects to, admit, to manifest. That's why 56% of all U.S. physicians refuse the shot. The U.S. U.K. government has hired a company to process the extremely high number of vaccine adverse events. Fears for the COVID-19 have been aggressively suppressed by media and governments. Physicians who successfully treat COVID patients are censored and banned. World-renowned biophysicist Andreas Kalker works with 5,000 physicians and helps save millions of lives, yet he was banned from Facebook. Don't hide from the truth. Dare to see what is really going on so you can defend your life and that of your loved ones. We work with world-leading scientists, lawyers, and medical experts to share this critical information. This is from StopWorldControl.com. Thank you. Thank you. Call in user 1401. Your microphone's now available. Your message needs to say press star nine to raise your hand and star six to unmute you, instead of the outgoing message. We have no further speakers, Chair. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I will bring it back to the board for consideration of the consent agenda. Supervisor Hernandez, do you have any comments on the consent agenda? I do, item, item 44. You know, I'm just uh, really glad to see that the Highway 152 Holohan Road intersection project is moving forward, uh, especially, you know, after the aftermath of the flooding there. It's good to see a project, not only for the residents there of of uh, call it the Holohan College area, but also the safety of all the students that, that attend the several schools that are there. It's been an unsafe uh, intersection for not just pedestrians and students, and but even drivers. So it's, I'm glad that project is moving forward. And with that, if I'll move the consent agenda as well. All right, Supervisor Hernandez, I appreciate that. I'll come back to you for the motion. I'm gonna continue with uh, our colleagues for comments. Um, Supervisor Cummings. I had a question, um, question slash comment to make this clarification. And number 36. Supervisor, thank you. There you go. So I had some uh, questions and comments on item number 36, which is to approve a two-year agreement with Housing Matters. The total amount of one point well, $1,242,700 for COVID-19 high-risk group sheltering services and take related actions as recommended by the director of human services. And so, um, you know, the county played a major role in housing a lot of people during the pandemic in the hotel program. And, um, you know, now that we've seen um, that the COVID-19 restrictions have been lifted and we're more or less out of the pandemic. We're still receiving funds, which is great to help house some of the uh, high-risk people. And so I'm just wondering, because I know that we sh the county shut down its hotel program, um, but then what we have before us is um, continuing to provide funding for uh, housing in some of the hotels. And so I'm just wondering if maybe the director could provide a little bit of context and background uh, for those of us who may be new to the board. Um, yes, good morning, Supervisor Cummings and board members. Um, you name that correctly let me first as a human service director share the human population we're talking about that's being served and then share why this action's in front of you it's a technical contract matter 
Um, so the population is when COVID um, hit the, the state, uh, the feds and the state released a lot of funding to try to do a lot of things to help ameliorate the spread of COVID. And for those who are unsheltered or needed to isolate or quarantine, a lot of federal and state money led to what we call the COVID shelter system in California called our project room key. We had about a thousand residents of the county in those hotels. A subset of them were just isolating and quarantining to make sure that they could be separated from people and then returning to home, but a large number were previously unsheltered. So as the COVID um, pandemic carried on, the federal and state government realized a number of people who were previously unsheltered would be returning to the streets without services. So we grabbed that money and we went to this board uh, two years ago in March of 21 and got approval to award two contracts. One was housing, housing Matters and one with Abode. And the purpose of that was to take this federal and state money to provide services to those in those hotels to help make sure whenever they closed, they would not have to return to the streets. The pandemic went on much longer than expected. And um, what happened is when we did close them in uh, this uh, summer, there were still about 40 people who we could not support finding housing because of a host of issues, um, criminal backgrounds, immigration status, very complex health issues, access and functional need issues. And so we were able to take that Housing Matters contract. Abode did not want to continue the work with hotels. And we were able to take federal and state money to help move them from our county run COVID hotel system into Housing Matters run hotel systems. So this about 35 people would have otherwise returned to the streets, still remain in hotels under that contract. So that's who's being served. The technical issue is the federal government, which funds this particular string of money, does not allow the contract as it exists today in Santa Cruz County to be braided and bundled together. We are required by a recent action of the feds and state to create a standalone contract naming the specific funding stream in order to draw the federal and state money. So the action we're asking of your board through this contract is to retroactively be able to pay housing matter for services already provided. The federal government will not reimburse us for those invoices without the technical action of the board matter today. And prospectively for the balance of this fiscal year, because we still have people who are getting service. Some have been successfully moved into housing, but some are still in the hotels. We are not able to draw that federal money. So lack of approving this would mean we'd have to have general fund to backfill or cut the program. So that's why we brought this forward. It's very complicated. I do appreciate you raising it because I don't think we went in that great a detail because we bring a lot of board matters to your board from Housing for Health. But I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. And I just want to uh, thank you all for your hard work to help making sure these people didn't end up back on the street. So um, I would just ask that I know as part of the contract, there's um status reports and performance reports and so the next time you all give your mid-year update on homelessness and the progress we're making that we can have some of those progress reports to understand um how well these funds are being used and and how well people are getting housed yeah and i i think we can do it both for uh funding not tied to covid but also all the contracts we have a large volume of contracts they're very complicated and we can do a summary in our next six month report on sort of where that money's going and what the outcomes are if that's what your point is we can bring that back Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Those are all my questions. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings. Supervisor Kennedy. Thank you, Chair Friend. I just wanted to express my appreciation on item 13, the annual report for mosquito abatement and vector control. Uh, the, this division or department, I should say, treated over 4,000 breeding sources last year uh, and took over 500 calls for a service. Mm -hmm. And seeing as, as it is spring, we're not the only ones excited about this. Obviously, the bugs are too. Uh, so I thought it'd be a good opportunity to highlight the fact that this uh, department does take calls for service and helps with tick identification, wasp abatement, rodent abatement, uh, and perhaps best of all, mosquito fish delivery. So thank you. Thank you. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, two items. Item number 39, uh, the Felton Remembers uh, Parade. Uh, I want to thank the organizers of that May 27th event, and uh, I look forward to participating in it. It's a great event that uh, uh, is uh, held usually every year, but COVID kind of got in the way of that for a while. Uh, item 42, the resurfacing, resurfacing of emergency routes. I want to thank the uh, Public Works Department for their resurface areas and the routes, which are critical for the Santa Rosa Valley, particularly Alba Road and Jamison Creek Road. And I know that um, 
people want us to get at these roads uh, more quickly than we have been able to do. We still have some roads uh, that we or haven't been funded from the 2016-17 storms. So uh, it's a, a game of catch up and we're trying to do the best we can and the Public Works Department is doing a very good job with the funding it has. So I wanna congratulate them. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Rosen McPherson. Uh, I'll just briefly speak on two items. Item 18, I appreciate the work of, of the Information Services Department on the migration of our website to .gov in order to make it more secure. And also just ask that as part of the uh, transition plan that we do a lot of community outreach since people do are used to sending us emails to a different account. So as we transition, just ensure that we make those notifications publicly. And on item 44, I, I share in Supervisor Hernandez's appreciation on this item on Highway 52 in Holohan, and, and also can can hear uh, the near uh, the near weekly comments and questions from Supervisor Caput over this exact thing. So I'm glad to see this this happening, and Supervisor Hernandez, you taking that mantle to see this all the way through. All right, Supervisor Hernandez, I'll turn it to you. I believe you had a motion you'd like to make. I'd like to move the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Hernandez, a second from Supervisor Koenig. Um, uh, we could have a roll call, please. Certainly, Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Aye. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. And that passes unanimously. We'll move on to an exciting item, which is the first item of the regular agenda, which is a presentation of the 2022 Employee Recognition Awards, as outlined in the memo of the CAO. We have the board memo as well as a list of the award winners. I'm going to turn it over to our CAO, Carlos Palacios, to introduce this item. Uh, thank you, Chair Friend and members of the board. This is the 2022 Employee Recognition Awards. Each year, the Board of Supervisors presents these awards to recognize and show appreciation to employees for their outstanding accomplishments while working with the county. The board will recognize employees for their work in the following areas. Number one, an employee or group of employees who have solved an extraordinary problem for the county and or demonstrated an outstanding accomplishment that furthered the county's goals. Number two, an employee or group of employees who found an opportunity for improvement and implemented an innovative idea. Or three, an employee or group of employees who demonstrated outstanding effort and service of the past year. The awards are grouped in the following categories of general government, health services, human services, justice and public safety, and land use regulation. Um, each board member will present the board, will present one of the award areas. Board members will come down from the dais and stand at the microphone. As the employees hear their name or the name of their team announced, they should come up to the front and join our board um, member. And at the conclusion of the awards event, a reception will be held in the hall adjacent to the board chambers. Everyone is invited to stay through the entirety of the presentation of awards and join us for the reception. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and get started and Supervisor Cummings will be the first uh, presenter and he'll be presenting our first awards in the category of general government. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Um, the first recipient of the Employee Recognition Award in the category of general government is Mauricio Pacheco. Mauricio Pacheco is the county warehouse supervisor and has worked diligently to improve the physical warehouse spaces in the areas of organization. And he and his team have made significant improvements to the process of inventory control through the use of technology and implementing new tools. Not only does Mauricio perform a tremendous amount of work for departments throughout the county to problem solve their storage needs, he also steps in during disaster events, handling the high pressure work of managing and coordinating resources. Mauricio does all of this with sincere enthusiasm for his work, the kind demeanor, and his pride for county operations is apparent in every action taken, be it regularly volunteering for additional duties or making one final run to meet the needs of customers. With his dedication, professionalism, loyalty, courtesy towards others, and his incredible, incredibly strong work ethic, Mauricio exemplifies the highest standard and character traits of a county employee and public servant. So thank you, Mauricio, for your service. Thank you. Okay. 
The second award is in the category of general government, uh, is being presented to the ISD budget website development team, which is co comprised of Yan Zhang and Tom Oconian. The primary policy and planning tool for the County of Santa Cruz is the yearly budget, guiding over $1 billion in spending on community services and infrastructure so that all individuals have opportunities to lead healthy, safe lives. In June of 2022, for the first time in the county's history, the, the budget was presented primarily through a county website and database developed by Yan Zhang and Tom Milconian in the Information Services Department. The majority of the site was constructed and designed in-house based on local stakeholder feedback, and the site integrates standard web functions that increase access to the public, such as translation tools and mobile device-friendly format. Having a budget website dramatically increases CAO staff effectiveness by reducing production time and increasing time dedicated to policy guidance on strategic and operational investments. The prior printed version of the budget always included an errata section to correct errors in the printed book, and the online version of the budget eliminates 95% of those errors due to its integration with the county's budget system. The budget website developed by Tom and Yan is also flexible enough to allow for incremental innovation in the county's budget, and the database is adaptable and able to expand and add more ways to break down budget data as the county's needs change over time. By moving to an online presentation, the budget is more accessible and accountable to the public, reduces production time and mistakes, and establishes a foundation for future innovation. So join me in thanking Yan and Tom for all their hard work and efforts in this incredible project. Mm -hmm. The final employee recognition award in the category of general government is being presented to the general services department custodial team. I'm going to read off a list of folks. Um, Salvador Vasquez is going to be accepting this on behalf of this group, but Roman Anyana, Jose Anyana Rocha, Alejandro Carranco, Amy Cobos, Rocio Hernandez, Maria de Leon, Felipe Garcia Cruz, Randy Grimes, Araceli Hernandez, Jose Hernandez, Pedro Hernandez, Angel Mangana, Maria Mondragon, Gilbert Moreno, Emily Olagues Cruz, Olga Perez, Arthur Ramirez, Salvador Vasquez, Rosario Victoria. The General Services custodial team is, is collectively responsible for over 30 facilities consisting of 475,000 square feet of offices, clinics, and community and public serving spaces throughout the county. And they are an integral and highly valued part of the county workforce, providing clean, safe, and welcoming facilities for staff and visitors. During the past few years, the custodial team has been essential in assuring the safety of our county employees during the COVID-19 pandemic and have routinely responded to necessary COVID-19 cleanings, bloodborne pathogen issues, and other emergency cleanup on top of managing their regular day-to-day -day responsibilities. The custodial team adapted their job responsibilities, finding new ways to meet the expanded workload, even when understaffed or when team members were out sick themselves, thereby further protecting the public and county staff. Every day, the custodial team showed up with determination and with smiles behind their mask while they diligently worked on the front lines so that fellow staff, community members, and at-risk individuals could continue to access county services. The custodial team exemplifies the meaning of teamwork and has performed these duties with the highest level of dedication and professionalism, keeping with the deepest traditions of public service. I know I can speak for my colleagues and all county staff when I say that we appreciate all of you and the hard work that you do. So congratulations on this employee recognition award. And with that, I'll turn it over to Supervisor Koenig, who will be presenting awards in the category of health services.
All right, good morning. First recipient of the Employee Recognition Award in the category of Health Services is the Older Adult Services Team, comprised of mental health client specialist Adam Eccles and occupational therapist Suzanne Fisher. During the summer months of 2022, the Older Adult Services team found themselves extremely shorthanded with four vacancies on the team, leaving only one coordinator, Adam, and the occupational therapist, Susan, to cover over 90 vulnerable senior clients struggling with severe mental illness and complex medical issues, not to mention the near constant threat in Santa Cruz of becoming unhoused. This team of two, known for their innovation, impeccable organization, resilience, and personalized dedication to client care, use quick action and creative methods to restructure caseloads and add extra shifts and innovate approaches to their work. Adam and Susan developed and used a new tier system to identify elderly clients in most need of in-person assistance and crisis support, while also identifying which clients were more capable of becoming integrated with community partners, family, friends, faith-based services, and community senior programs available outside the county purview. The ongoing occupational care groups, use of senior companions, senior citizens, volunteering assistants supervised by Susan, and the crucial partnership with Front Street were the foundation of their approach during the difficult transition time. Instead of only focusing on their own list of seniors to coordinate care for, Adam and Susan took a wide lens view of their situation and were able to skillfully and creatively deliver care and services that is second to none. Without a disgruntled word or a well-deserved need to complain, Adam and Susan used humor, wisdom, and experience and team dedication to meet the high needs uh, and demands that older adult services is known for addressing. Thank you, Susan and Adam, for your commitment to the needs of your clients, and congratulations on this Employee Recognition Award. Thank you, Thank you. Would you like to say a few words? We're, we're very honored to be here and couldn't have done it with the support without the support of our supervisor, Ryan Sisti, who's here to uh, support us in the cheering section in the back. Thanks so much. The next award in the category of health services is being presented to the Behavioral Health Cultural Humility Committee, comprised of Joanna Moody, Christina Borbley, Claudette de Godoy, Lisa Gutierrez Wang, and Kristen Olafson. In early 2017, behavioral health supervisor Joanna Moody identified a missing and yet essential piece of children's behavioral health efforts to become a trauma-informed organization with a clear focus on cultural humility. Joanna proposed and was approved to start a cultural humility committee, which was framed as a committee that would recognize that cultural oppression is a significant form of trauma that interacts in complex ways with other trauma experiences and affects individuals, institutions, and society, and seeks to increase this understanding with staff. Joanna sought membership among behavioral health staff, and under her leadership, the CHC was created, has created resources to spread understanding of a range of issues related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is helping to incrementally advance our workforce's development, resulting in better client care. The CHC created a newsletter, the Cultural Compass, in which Compass was an acronym for Compassion, Open-Mindedness, Perseverance, Awareness, Sensitivity, and Safety which focuses on a chosen culturally relevant topic and provides information, ideas for clinical applications, and resources for extra study. In addition to the Compass newsletters, the CHC has been instrumental in developing a diversity calendar, which includes email announcements that have been sent to behavioral health staff to promote awareness of calendared events that honor diverse cultural perspectives. The CHC has also recently started facilitating the Culture Cafe, which are bi-monthly events at which the CHC creates and presents educational content as a backdrop for important cultural conversations that lead into breakout group discussions. The CHC's efforts are helping to solve the challenge of how to engage and educate a large, very busy workforce about racism, diversity, and equity, and forge a more respectful and compassionate workforce serving some of our most vulnerable community members. I'm pleased to present the Cultural Humility Committee with this Employee Recognition Award. Do you want to share a few words? 
I just want to also acknowledge uh, Lisa and Claudette were named in this prize, but there are other people that have been part of the Cultural Humility uh, Project for, for a while. So I just want to want to name Joaquin Barreto and, and Belinda Ledesma Pena, who also were uh, extremely helpful for us in our ongoing project. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And next up, I believe, is Supervisor Mc... Fernandez. Great. Let's stay there. I'm presenting. I'm presenting in the Human Services Department, and the first recipient of the Employee Recognition Award in the category of Human Services is Justin Braun. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Justin is an administrative aide at the Human Services Department and participated in 2021 and 2022 annual Human Services Department mentorship program as a mentee. And as a part of the evaluation process, Justin submitted a suggestion to offer a monthly mentee support group throughout the mentorship period for increased support and demystification of the mentorship experience. Justin suggested that the support groups could help mentees prioritize their work and their mentorships through, through, taking, through talking with each other and other mentees who had already completed the program. Justin offered to develop and implement and facilitate these support groups on top of his own participation in the 2022 mentorship and his work supporting IT. Justin's efforts were well received by other mentees and support group he created was helpful in providing mentees with a voice to articulate what they wanted to learn and better guide their mentorships. Justin not only maintained the support group throughout the year, but he also participated in the evaluation process and made changes based on feedback to meet the Human Services Department's cultural goals around continuous process improvement. Thanks to Justin, this mentee support group will be a standard part of the mentorship program going forward. Congratulations on this Employee Recognition Award, Justin, and thank you for your dedication to the county. The next award in the category of human services is being presented to senior social worker, Stevie Harrison. Stevie is described as empathetic, resourceful, and resilient, and has been a mentor, lead worker, and stand-in advisor for several new social workers as they have entered the field. Stevie is currently a Title IV-E student, and while in this program, she has completed internships with the Resource Family Approval un Unit, the Investigations Unit, and is now entering the Case Review Unit. Stevie works with multiple youth who are, who are involved in our juvenile probation system. She collaborates with both Dependency and Probation Court, providing them with updates and even attends weekly hearings on one of her cases. Stevie is involved in multiple committees with family and children's services and is a member of the design team and a work group geared towards recruitment and retention of resource parents. And she is actively working to help implement safety organized practices, SOPs. Stevie is deeply committed to youth on her caseload. One example being a case of a youth that she supported as he transitioned into adulthood helped him to obtain gender affirming care and facilitated him reestablishing a relationship with his father who lives out of state. And Stevie did all this while pursuing her master's degree. Stevie continues to serve on the family on families on her caseload, support people around her, active, actively work to improve the division and shine an example of resilience. Thank you, Stevie, for your commitment to the youth of our county and congratulations. Thank you. 
And the final award in the category presented is to the IT desktop team comprised of Adam Papier, Kelly Beach, Patrick Blue, and Todd Estabrooks. Congratulations. Congratulations. The IT desktop team has been responsible for deploying hardware to the human services department, wrote, uh, remote staff, maintaining hardware needs, developing docking stations for over 500 employees. That's on top of their overwhelming daily responsibilities, which they all manage effectively while providing excellent customer service. The IT desktop team has also stepped up to handle the numerous ergonomic sit-stand accommodations installation requests, which have increased heavily in the last year due to loss of staffing in all our facilities unit. This team took on the initiative to learn how to do sit-stand accommodation installations, how to most effective, effectively and safely install them in a way that benefited staff safety, time, and need, and still allowed them to complete their daily desktop assignments. The IT desktop team has streamlined the process, saving human services department both time and money and ensuring a better working environment for our HSD staff. Thank you for all your hard work and congratulations on receiving this employee recognition award. And we, where would we be without the IT team? Congratulations. Thank you. Next is Chair Friend. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. And uh, Vice Chair Cummings, if you wouldn't mind coming down to help with the distribution of these. Thank you. I'm excited today to do the uh, Justice and Public Safety category. And the first recipient of the Employee Recognition Award in the category of Justice and Public Safety is the District Attorney Public Defender System Team, comprised of Dylan Jones and Gabe Jones. So please, Dylan and Gabe, feel free to come up. In July of 2021, both the district attorney and public defender began a solicitation for a case management system. And by November of 2022, both departments were able to implement new case management systems on time and on budget. The success of the implementation is largely due to the overwhelming dedication and talent and, and talent of Gabe Jones in the district attorney's office and Dylan Jones in the public defender's office. Both Dylan and Gabe worked hard and across partner agencies, including the superior court, the sheriff, probation, and other law enforcement agencies and services to ensure integration with their new systems and continuity of operations within the criminal justice system. Dylan and Gabe also ensured adequate training for their combined department staffs of nearly 150 employees and continue today to troubleshoot and support those staff as they rely increasingly on their performance of these systems to prosecute and defend their cases. Less than 18 months later, both the DA and the public defender have fully functional case management systems that are being used by staff and will continue to grow and support both agencies as they uphold public safety. Dylan and Gabe are responsible for that success and deserve accolades for their service to the county, as well as their overall talent and leadership in providing the necessary IT infrastructure to support the approximately 11,000 cases that get processed each year in Santa Cruz County. Thank you and congratulations, Dylan and Gabe. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick word. I really want to thank both the attorneys and the staff at the PDO because they were very supportive and had to go through a great deal to help us bring this system up. I know they still suffer a little bit with some things we're hoping to fix as we go along, but thank you very much, everyone. Oh. And perhaps also the... The unsung heroes, the ISD team, who provides all of the server infrastructure and the networking that's allowing the system to run and their constant maintenance. So thank you. Outstanding. All right. Well, the second award is being presented to the juvenile hall supervisor team comprised of Alicia Padilla, Padilla Andrew Vasquez, Gabriel Haro. Isaac Chipres, Shauna Confer, Johnny Perez, and Spencer Bittescombe, if you could please come forward. Yeah. 
All right, well, at the start of 2022, our community was reopening, vaccines and PPA, PPE were available, yet COVID-19 continued to significantly impact the juvenile hall, uh, juvenile hall facility. Supervisors had the challenge of meeting the behavioral health needs and providing services to the youth in their care with the necessity for the health and safety of the staff, partners, youth, and their families. The juvenile hall supervisors stayed informed and educated about the current practices and county policies as COVID evolved and impacted our community and the high caliber of knowledge and experience of the supervisor team allowed staff to confidently and safely perform their critical roles and duties and provide services and security for the youth in their care 24 hours a day and seven days a week. A top priority was how to address and end the social isolation so many youth experienced and managed and manage how to safely resume in-person family visiting because while virtual visitation and services had become a valuable resource, they could not replace the vital in-person connections that support youth. Supervisors worked with management to develop policies and practices that incorporated testing, mask mandates, and careful scheduling to ensure physical distance and no overlapping to allow time to fully sanitize rooms and equipment between visitors. With creativity, communication, and documentation, they were able to put these new practices and policies into place to safely operate the detention facility and allow for this critical in-person visiting as well as continuing services by our volunteers and providers. So I would also like to note that we were one of the few uh, juvenile halls in, in the state that didn't have an outbreak, and it's not mentioned here, but I think a lot of it has to do to your great work. So thank you for all your commitment and dedication to the youth and the care and your families, and congratulations on receiving this Employee Recognition Award. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, the final award in the category of justice and public safety is being presented to Assistant District Attorney Nicole Ellen Jones. Feel free to come up, Nicole. Thank you. All right, well, Nicole consistently goes above and beyond her job in service to this community as a passionate advocate for the voiceless, particularly children and animals. And when assets from narcotic sales have been seized, Nicole investigates whether that defendant has outstanding child support payments to ensure that those children are the recipients of any seized funds. And last year, her passion for animals led her to spearhead a significant cat rescue in and around our county's main building. In the summer of 2022, it became apparent that there were numerous feral cats living around the, ca the county building when a litter of kittens was located in the atrium. When Nicole learned of the situation, she sprang into action with her contacts at the local nonprofit Project Per and utilized all the relationships she has with various partners in the building, including fleet services, general services, allied security, and multiple colleagues at the DA's office for assistance in helping address the cat issue. She spent hours of her own time on evenings and weekends setting up traps and monitoring the cats with game cameras. And through her connections, diligence, and her unwillingness to give up on the animals, 19 of them, including 14 kittens, were able to be fixed and rehomed. Thank you, Nicole, for your tireless efforts and dedication to our community members, be them human or animal, and congratulations on this well-deserved award. I wanted to quickly say thank you so much to Project Per. They're here today, some representatives, Lynn. We could not have done this without you. Uh, we had 19 cats and kittens, 18 requiring spay and neuter, 17 were feral, 16 of them were spayed and neutered and vaccinated by Project Per. Again, 14 kittens, as Supervisor Friend just mentioned, uh, one animal, service did, animal services fix, but the rest were from Project Per. We couldn't have done it without you. But also, I have to thank Fleet Services, uh, Robert and Randall, and I believe uh, Jesus and Fleet Services. We had the Fosters who got these cats up to weight and ready to and healthy and ready to be fixed. They also socialized them. No small feat. It's much easier to cat, catch a cat than it is to socialize one. Uh, some of these uh, kittens were very spicy. Uh, thank you to general services, uh, uh, the colleagues there, the security guards. Thank you to the courts for allowing me, both uh, Santa Cruz County locally and the state had to coordinate to let me go underneath the jury trailer to look for uh, these kittens along with Nick Simpson from the district attorney's office. 
<laughs> and much to our chagrin, Mama Kitty just sat there within about 10 feet of us and just looked at us. And then she cleaned herself. Uh, we didn't find them then, but we eventually did find them. But we appreciate all of our help. We could not have done it without Project Per. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Now we're going to turn it over to Supervisor McPherson, who will be presenting awards in the category of land use and regulatory. Supervisor McPherson. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Friend. Um, the first recipient of the Employee Recognition Award in the category of land use and regulatory is Sean Mathis. Sean Mathis is a supervisor in the Department of Community Development and Infrastructure Sanitation Operations Group. And this past year, Sean designed and implemented an innovative way to improve the method by which the Sanitation Operations Group performs inspections of sewer manholes, which will save the county considerable costs in coming years, as well as help to reduce the risk of sewer overflows from entering water bodies in the county. The Sanitation Operations Group maintains more than 5,000 sewer sanitary manholes throughout the county, and many of these manholes are several de decades or more old and often deteriorate due to hydrogen sulfide gases within the sewer system. Sean, consistently working for ways to improve operational procedures, invited a vendor to do a demonstration of a camera system to assist with manhole operations. During this demo, Sean noticed that there was too much outside light to provide clear images and so felt like he could come up with a less expensive camera system. Sean took the initiative to design a cover to go over the manholes during inspections that would block out sunlight and which would included and included rechargeable lights mounted it on the bottom of the cover light inside of the manhole. It also included a center hole cut in the cover that allowed a second part of Sean's design a pole with a GoPro camera with a fisheye lens attached to it, you got all that, um, to be lowered into the manhole to record videos and images of the inside the manholes. Sean's prototype cost $1,400 to fabricate, significantly less than the vendor's $15,000 system, and the images are substantially clearer, which will make assessment and evaluation of the condition of the manholes much more efficient. Because of Sean's proactive and creative problem solving, staff will be able to make better informed decisions on which manholes to prioritize for rehabilitation, repair, or replacement. I am pleased to present Sean with this Employee Recognition Award and thank him for his innovative spirit and creativity. Well, he's not here today, uh, and our next uh, awardee is not here today either. Uh, the second award for the land use and regulatory uh, is presented to Tatiana Brennan, the Senior Administrative Analyst for the Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience. Last year, Tatiana was the project manager for the development of the county's 2022 Climate Action and Adopt Adaption Plan, or CAP. This has been the first major update of our county policy and strategies in addressing climate change since 2013. And the plan frames our climate emergency, introduces the framework for the plan and outlines the strategies and the objectives to meet our greenhouse gas emission targets as set by the state law. The design and development of the 2022 CAP used an accelerated 11-month time frame and a collaborative process incorporated different levels of county staff into the development of the CAP strategies and objectives that used a new equity framework to ensure that the county consider <coughs> and address the desperate, uh, desperate um, impacts of climate change on our vulnerable and underserved residents. And Tatiana led this eternal county staff team, which consisted of three work groups, each organized around different areas of climate vulnerabilities and were comprised of a total of 28 subject matter experts from 10 county departments. 
Tatiana managed these work groups and the county staff over a very, very tight timeline supported by four climate interns and CAO staff in their facilitation of meetings and work closely with the consultant team and community partners to build an inclusive, innovative and equity forwarded cap approved by the Board of Supervisors. And Tatiana developed many useful project management tools that have already been integrated into other county initiatives from a project management standpoint. And thanks to Tatiana's dedication, expertise, and clear communication and project vision, the 2022 cap was delivered on time and will help guide our county towards the greenhouse gas reduction targets set by state law. Thank you, Tatiana, for your hard work and dedication, and I'm pleased to present you with this Employee Recognition Award, but she couldn't be here today. Maybe she took a break. Can you believe that she needed some time off to hear all that? Thank you, Tatiana. And the final award in this category is being presented to the Mosquito and Vector Control Division comprised of Amanda Polson, Stephen Bowling, Stephen Driscoll, Michael Penny, Nader Sidholm, Ray Travers, Emma McDonough. Are any of you here? There you go. Yeah, thank you. God, come up and join me. The Mosquito and Vector Control Division protects the public from pests capable of transmitting disease or creating a nuisance. In early October 2022, the division received a service request to control aggressive biting mosquitoes in Watsonville, which prompted the division to set up surveillance of the area as well as set traps in an attempt to identify mosquito breeding sources. October 13th, 2022, the division received confirmation from the California Department of Public Health that the invasive mosquito Aedes AGP, also known as a yellow fever mosquito, that's a little easier, uh, which can transmit dung, Zika, and yellow fever had been found in one of those traps. Although these diseases are not currently present in our area, the division quickly jumped into action by closely working with the California Department of Public Health to formulate an action plan to determine the, sever the extent of the infestation and to work with community members in the small neighborhood in Watsonville where the mosquito was found. The Mosquito and Vector Control Division went above and beyond in outreaching to the affected neighborhood by knocking on doors, working on weekends to ensure engagement with all residents and being inclusive by having a translator and information in Spanish. This personal level outreach was extremely helpful in engaging with the community and getting their support and doing their part to monitor and reduce the potential mosquito breeding sources throughout or through dumping standing water and allowing for the setting of mosquito traps. Thanks to the division's quick actions and thorough efforts, they were able to contain the infestation and prevent further spread to the other parts of the county. Thank you all so much for what you have done to protect our community and congratulations on receiving this Employee Recognition Award. Anybody like to see? Thank you. Thank you, Board of Supervisors, for this, this great honor. Um, you know, I think we're here today to recognize, um, you know, our, our team's great service to the community. Um, thanks to the neighborhood, too. They welcomed us. Um, it wasn't an easy task. But uh, Mike, Steve, Stephen, Ray, Emma, Nader, um, thank you for your hard work. We're a small but mighty team. Um, but, you know, you all live and breathe public service. And um, your dedication to public health in this community is it's really honorable. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Palacios. You'd like to close the item up? Uh, thank you once again, um, Chair Friend and members of the board, and thank you to our employees. Uh, really is a great recognition uh, so many of our employees um, give so much during every year, especially in these difficult years that we have been through uh, with the effects of climate change and the continuing um, end of the pandemic. And so to be recognized is truly an honor. I truly congratulate each and every one of you. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Palacios. We do have the best employees. I'd also like to thank uh, Caitlin Smith for her work helping organize today's event. Thank you for all of your work with that. We'll move on to item eight on our regular agenda, which is a public hearing to consider the proposed 2023-24 benefit assessment rates for county service area number 40 to request the submittal of ballots for the proposed 23-24 benefit assessments, continue the public hearing to May 9th, 2023 and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the Deputy CAO, Director of Community Development and Infrastructure. And we have the agenda board uh, item here and we have uh, Mr. Machado here for this item. Mr. Machado. Thank you, Chair and Supervisors, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, as you mentioned, the item before you is a public hearing for CSA 40. Uh, the CSA 40 reps did request the board adopt a resolution of intention to authorize and levy an increased assessment for road maintenance and operations within CSA number 40, also known as Ralston Way. Um, in order to complete the proposed benefit assessments, it'll be necessary for the board to open the public hearing, take testimonies, and consider objections or protest to the proposed benefit assessments, and then to close the public comment portion of the public hearing and to continue the public hearing to May 9th of 23 to follow, to allow for tabulation and certification of the ballots. And I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Machado. It seems pretty self-explanatory. Do any board members have any uh, questions on this item? Okay, we're going to open up the public hearing. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on this item. Any member of the community and chambers, please feel free to step forward on this item. Chair, it looks like we do not have any speakers uh, in chambers with us. However, it does look like one person has their hand raised online. Thank you. Oh, someone's approaching the podium. Under the storm. <laughs> I'm the president of CSA 40, so I'm new to this whole process. The only thing that I'd like to ask is that you strongly consider, can you hear me? How's that? That you strongly consider the passing. I know we have to open ballots. I'm not sure how this whole process works, but we were established in 1985 and we haven't had an increase in our benefit assessments since 1985. And as you can imagine with the cost of living and the inflation, we're not doing very well with maintaining our road. So I would strongly encourage support for passing this ballot measure. And I'm assuming that, I'm hoping that we got all of our ballots returned. So that's all I needed to say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you also for volunteering to be in the leadership on CSA 40. Are there any other members within chambers that would like to address us before we go to the individual that is online? Uh, seeing none, Madam Clerk, online. Thank you, Chair. Call in user 1401. Your microphone is now available. I have a request that when the agenda is published, and you put like, for instance, here, service area number 40, that you put in this agenda where that's located. And I, I often find that's what's called benefit assessments is increased taxes. I'm not familiar with this specific thing and I, Often my assessment is it doesn't help the public much what the county is doing. Um, <laughs> that's, that's my comment, thank you. Is there anybody else online, Madam Clerk? We have no further speakers, Chair. Okay, and the agenda item does actually describe where, agenda, where CSA 40 is. Uh, seeing no other members of the community, we will then close uh, the public comment portion of the public hearing and bring it back to the board. There are a series of recommended actions and to the question of the individual 
in the community about whether we'd be tabulating the ballots today. Uh, one of the recommended actions is to continue this public hearing to May 9th to allow for the tabulation and certification of the ballots. This was a public hearing to allow for any objections or protests, if there were any, to request the submittal of all ballots for the benefit assessment and then to close the public comment portion of the public hearing. Uh, so it'll be May 9th that we'll have a determination on this. Oh, sorry, sir, there was uh, one additional individual would like to comment on CSA 40s during the public hearing. I'll reopen the public hearing opportunity because I want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to speak during the public hearing. Sir, go ahead. Yes, hello, my name is James Ewing Whitman. I wasn't going to make public comments on this because after reading the information in the binder, it just really made sense. But when you look at the general packet, where some individuals who are very much affected by the use of computers and wireless and obviously would be here if they could. Uh, it, when it's described, it doesn't actually say what part of the county it's in. Um, otherwise, that's all I wanted to say, just clarification. Okay, are there any other members of the community that'd like to address us during the public comment portion of the public hearing? Seeing none, we will close then the public comment portion of the public hearing and bring it back to the board for the recommended actions. I'll move recommended actions two and four. Second. Um, were you just all the recommended actions, Supervisor Koenig? I mean, I'm, I'll move all the recommended actions. I think we've effectively done one and three. But. Yeah, sure. Okay. I understand. Just want to make sure that we we're clear. So we'll do all the recommended actions. And the second was from Supervisor Cummings. Thank you. So every motion from Supervisor Koenig, second from Supervisor Cummings. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Friend. Aye. And that passes unanimously. We'll move on to item nine, which is a public hearing to consider application 211192, a proposal to approve a boundary adjustment and rezoning of a portion of APN 063-132-08 from the Mineral Extraction Industrial or M3 zone district to the Timber Production or TP zone district. Determine the proposal is exempt from the requirements of the California Environmental Quality Act and adopt an ordinance amending zoning plan and map pursuant to chapter 113.10 of the Santa Cruz County Code changing from one zone district to another and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the deputy CAO. We have the agenda board item, the ordinance amending it, the sequence notice of exemption and all of the planning commission actions. I believe we have Evan Dittmars here to provide a uh, presentation on this. Uh, yes. Uh, good morning, Chair and members of the board. My name is Evan Dittmars, uh, Development Planner with Community Development and Infrastructure. The proposed project involves two adjacent parcels in Bonnie Dune, approximately four miles north of the Bonnie Dune Road and Highway 1 intersection. 1000 Bonnie Dune Road, APN 063-13208 is the larger of the two parcels at 253 acres. It had historically been used as a quarry and is reflected as such with an M3 mineral extraction industrial uh, zoning designation. The quarry is decommissioned and under reclamation. The smaller parcel APN 06312107 is 48 acres of undeveloped forest and carries a uh, timber production zoning designation. The proposed project would transfer 105 acres from the decommissioned quarry to the smaller TP zone parcel, and then rezoning those 105 acres from M3 to TP timber production to match the zoning designation of 06312107 and to facilitate a timber harvest. Uh, as indicated in the staff report, the lot line adjustment is consistent with the regulations established in Title 14, Chapter 1 of the Santa Cruz County Code and all of the criteria for a lot line adjustment have been met. The rezoning is facilitated by provisions of section 51113 of California government code, referred to as an adjacency rezoning, which allows an owner of timberland to rezone their land to timber production if the land meets the following criteria. The parcels must be contiguous, the parcels must be timberland, they must be under ownership of one person, they must be capable of producing wood fiber at a minimum of 15 cubic feet per acre annually. 
the uses on the parcel must be uh, uses on the lands to be rezoned must be compatible with timber harvesting and timber management. And as indicated in the staff report, the applicant has provided a forester's letter in support of the project and affirming compliance with the requirements and criteria of section 5113. The planning commission considered the item at public hearing held on February 22nd, 2023 and adopted a resolution recommending approval of the project. Staff have not received correspondence on the project since that hearing. And therefore, the recommendation to your board is as follows to conduct a public hearing on application 211192 to determine the pro proposal is exempt from further review under the California Environmental Quality Act pursuant to Article 18, Sections 15264, a statutory exemption for Timberland Preserves, and Article 19, Section 15305, minor alterations to land. Uh, to adopt the uh, attached ordinance amending the county's zoning plan and map pursuant to Santa Cruz County Code 1310215 and changing that portion of transferred lands from mineral extraction industrial to timber production and approve application 211192 based on the findings and conditions contained in the staff report to the Planning Commission dated February 22nd, 2023. And that concludes my presentation and I am available for questions. Thank you for the presentation. Are there any board members that have any questions before we open the public hearing? Uh, seeing none, I would now like to open up the public hearing on this item. Are there any members within chambers that would like to address, any community members within chambers that would like to address us on this item? Good morning, welcome. Yeah, hello, um, about this item. You know, I don't mean to, I read through as much of it as I could, and I don't know if I specifically have any real concerns, but I am actually going to question every bit of this. It seems like this board rubber stamps whatever they want to do and whatever they don't want to do. You know, I just witnessed a really nice presentation, but um, it seems like this board just reminds me of a Jekyll and Hyde and why you certainly take the time to celebrate things that should be celebrated. The amount of deception going on is, is astronomical. This agenda item number nine seems very straightforward. They're just changing the use. But even today, people came in that have been trying to follow rules that were here before, like the CZU fires, but all these things have changed. And once again, there's a whole new area where they cannot move in and so i'm not saying that this is a cherry-picked issue it is my understanding that unless one member anyone actually objects to something in this there's not much you can do in the future as far as a lawsuit so i don't know if i'm going to do anything about this because i took the time to read it and i was interested um but i wanted to say something about what this board and boards like this are doing for the public good and you guys are supposed to be working for the public but that's just a big deception look at the flag that you guys celebrate that's not representing the public so i guess i'll have to read further and see if i have anything to say specifically i don't think i did i took the time to look at it so thank you any other members of the community and chambers i'd like to address us on this item before we move to those that may be online <coughs> I've seen none. Madam Clerk, is there anybody online? Yes. Call in user 1401. Your microphone is now available. You are un Marilyn Garrett, and I have been in this county since 1981 and have seen on numerous agendas items having to do with what you call timber production, which is actually logging and sometimes clear cutting. And I have also seen a huge decrease in the tree canopy cover abundance in this county. And this item appears to be part of it. I 
makes me cry going up Highway 1 with the trees cut there. Just vast everywhere. And the trees are the lungs of the earth. Uh, So I very much question approval of more and more what you call, (coughs) excuse me, timber production. The other point here is the exemption from requirements of the California Environmental Quality Act. It seems to me that there was a mineral extraction industrial zone, that there must be a lot of toxic chemicals and the impact of that extraction, like there always is. I've always seen this exemption for all the cell tower proposals when we know there are documented environmental impacts to birds and bees and trees and people. So I, um, it's very questionable and disturbing to me the destruction of the nature scape in this county that I have witnessed since I moved here. And the trees and the phytoplankton in the earth are the lungs of the earth. We we have to have oxygen and it's being depleted massively by all kinds of industrial uh, and logging practices. So this is very questionable to me. I wouldn't vote for it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Are there any other speakers online, Madam Clerk? We have no further speakers, Chair. All right, then we will close the public comment period and we will bring it back to the board. There are a series of four recommended actions. Is there a motion from board member for those recommended actions? I'll move the staff recommended actions. Second. We have a motion. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we have a motion. Oh, yeah, please. I just want to say um, for, for the general public, uh, Santa Cruz County probably has the strictest timber production laws in the state of California. So, and it goes through a hearing process and notification process. So uh, I feel very comfortable in voting for this. Thank you. We have a motion from Supervisor Cummings, a second from Supervisor Koenig. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Aye. McPherson. Aye. And Friend. All right, and that will conclude our meeting. I'd also like to just briefly acknowledge our new official chief deputy clerk, Juliet Burke. Congratulations on your promotion. You are doing wonderful work, and we're glad to have you in that role. That will conclude our meeting today. Thank you, Chair.